Seriously Balkans, the Biapod Talks. Your in-depth analysis and discussion of current events in the Western Balkans. Welcome to Seriously Balkans, the podcast of Biapag. My name is Florian Bieber and I'm joined by Tena Prelets in today's podcast and Tena will be telling us what we have prepared for today's episode. Welcome everybody. So today we will treat a really important topic which is air pollution in the Balkans and the environmental activism that has sprung across the region in this regard. Afterwards we will also treat a research project that uh, we have conducted at Biepag bringing you the latest data in regard to green transition in the region and the role of external actors in it. Seriously Balkans. The Biepag talks. Every winter it's the same picture. As the temperature drops, air pollution levels skyrocket. Heating, industry, car pollution and cities located surrounded by mountains lead to a situation where pollution levels are so dramatic that it is safer to keep your windows closed rather than to open them for fresh air. The result is striking. Over 42,000 people die in 2021 across the Western Balkans due to air pollution, so the European Environmental Agency states. Those numbers are somewhere around 17,000 in Serbia, nearly 10,000 in Bosnia-Herzegovina, 5,500 approximately in North Macedonia, and so these numbers are altogether nearly the same level as in Germany, a country of much larger size than the Western Balkan countries uh, taken altogether and with a much higher industrial output. So to tackle this issue and to get some insights, we're talking to Goran Jovanovski, who is the CEO and co-founder of EarthCare in Skopje, North Macedonia, and to Denis Zizko, who works at the Aarhus Center in Bosnia-Herzegovina, based in Tuzla. Seriously, Balkans. The Biepod Talks. So, Gorjan, how is the air like today in Skopje? Is it already winter bad or still bearable? It is becoming winter bad. I'm looking at uh, the air care application that I've made right now throughout Skopje, and we can already see both in the east and in the west of the city there there's pollution looming so that means somewhere in the center where we are now it's going to get quite bad in a couple hours so unfortunately the season has started it's kind of every winter the same story why are things not getting better or are there actually signs of improvement um this winter around in comparison to previous years i don't think so so you will hear um local politicians tend to to come up with numbers to say hey look uh, air pollution has improved in, in, in the past years, which is simply not true because the instruments that they use to measure these, these me- official measuring stations from the government, uh, they tend to not work uh, a lot of the time during the year. So you cannot really make an average out of half of the data missing and then sit and claim something with it. Um, especially troublesome was the last report we got from, um, from the European Environmental Agency where you see that in 2021, uh, 5.6 thousand people have lost their lives here. Uh, prematurely due to the pollution. That number before was 4,000. So it has actually gotten worse rather than better. So why is it so hard to tackle this issue? I mean, especially if you're mentioning the number of lives lost. I mean, that's a dramatic number for any context. So this would seem like an emergency call for any government, any authority to really do all it takes. So, So why is there no progress? For me, it's crazy. I think one of the problems with pollution that we have here is same like the, the problems with the climate crisis, because the effects come later. So, for example, if I go out there and I and I breathe polluted air right now, I won't probably fall down and die on the street. Uh, but in 10, 20, 30 years time, when I start developing cancer, when my immune system is completely ruined, when, when I start having serious uh, health problems, then it's a little bit too late to act. And again, same with the climate crisis, because we don't see the immediate effects on our health today when we go outside, unlike what it was with COVID, for example. So that's why that warranted such a uh, such a massive reaction rather than this. Um, it should be not only a, an emergency, it should be a national emergency. There were at some points even, even discussions from the president that uh, this would be put on a national uh, security me- council meeting as, as a threat to national security. But those were, for in my opinion, more uh, PR stunts rather than uh, anything serious being taken because As far as I can see, there is no significant plan in fighting air pollution. There have been no uh, specific strides towards it. 
And the only time when it is being mentioned is during these winter months when it's popular to talk about it, let's say. It's not really a surprise that winter is coming despite global warming, it is still coming. So Gordian, many people say, well, it's just very complicated, it's very difficult, it's very expensive. So what would you say, what does it take to actually make a change in improving the air quality and reducing the level of pollution in a city like Skopje? Willpower and serious, serious motivation. We have the finances. We are allocating them to stupid projects throughout the city, stupid projects throughout the country that have little to no point being done right now, um, instead of focusing on what is a serious threat to the very existence of the people in this country. For example, in Skopje, we are in a geographically bad location. We're surrounded by mountains, we're in a valley. So that means that every winter, there is a natural phenomenon called the temperature inversion that happens. Basically, you have hot air rising from the city, cold air coming down from the currents. It creates a basically a lid right over the valley. And it's like a pot. You put a lid on top of it, and then all of the pollution that is being generated beneath cannot escape the city. And it boils and it boils and it boils until we get a change of temperature or, or some very strong winds blow to clear out the air. So we have to get understand and get used to that a lot of the cities in the Balkans are in the same geographical locations. And we cannot continue living our lives pretending that we're at the seaside where there's so much wind and, and all this pollution can be dispersed. We have to uh, basically change the ways that we live as people, that we live as a society based on the geographical locations that we're in. What does that mean concretely? Because I mean, again, I mean, if people are poor, uh, they burn a lot of exactly. materials which are pollutants. People have cars which are maybe not up to the highest uh, level. But in this is, to some degree, you could say a, a challenge of you know economic uh, you know welfare and challenges. How do you change that? How do you actually get to people live in accordance with the uh, environment and the, the, the geographical location the city finds itself in? Exactly. So first of all, you're going to start to subsidize. You have to subsidize and help people change the way that they heat their homes from uh, move it away from wood, move it away from construction material, help them get um, to electricity. There have been minimal subsidies happening, but definitely not as big as they should have been and not on a scale as they should have been. First of all, you have to do that. Second of all, you have to help them uh, change the energy efficiency of their own homes. So help make them more energy efficient from the facades, for example, so they don't lose the heat. So they'll spend less electricity heating their own homes. That is the subsidies that the government needs to put and a lot of money that needs to be put there in order to help them. There, there's EU funds that are available for this as well, and they should be used properly to help these people out. That's one part. Second part is inspectorates. So we have a lot of inspectorates um, in, in, in Macedonia that are completely ineffective. Uh, in the city of Skopje, there are possibly five inspectors that are able to go out uh, in, in one or two shifts, so definitely not even third shift, to catch any illegal dumps that are being burnt. There's a lot of uh, cables being burnt, the plastic being burnt off of them for copper so people can sell them. And again, that's that's due to the poor, poor economic condition of the country. Um, there's a lot of industries, factories, and even smaller businesses that burn constantly and pollute the air without being checked on. There is no 24-hour continued monitoring on any of these big industries officially from the government. And that's one of the other problems is that the industry is completely unchecked. They're allowed to do free roaming. And from time to time, when there's a lot of massive uproar from the people, then the inspectors would go out and say, ah, OK, we saw some ir irregularity. Here's like a thousand euro fine. Good luck. This is another serious problem that we don't have the capacity, even if we have the laws, we don't have the capacity to implement them, nor the will to pull that off. So put those two in combination. You have people that, that need subsidies. so bring the subsidies to them and then inspectors which actually need to be much more on a massive scale out there much more vigilant and to be finding and taking away work licenses in my opinion from any company that dares to pollute the air over what is being allowed to them by the ministry what would it take to change the kind of political dynamics i mean to in, kind of induce the political will you describe as lacking mm -hmm. to make those at least those first steps is it uh, new players? New players. You have to have new players. We have the same players in government from the two party system that we've had in Macedonia for ages now. So it's the same people rotating. You can't expect that these people have not become corrupt. You cannot expect that these people have not become under the influence of big industries. Um, 
I, you simply, you cannot tell me that within these 30 years, these people breathe special air or their children breathe special air or their parents breathe special air. No, we all breathe the same air. So it's definitely up to these people that are unwilling to do anything about this serious problem. It's nothing new. Me personally, I've been talking about it for the past eight years. I think it, 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 this is shocking that we've gone through governmental changes, through political changes, and yet the problem still persists, which tells me that these people who constantly rotate in power are incapable or unwilling to solve the problem, which means we need a new, fresh change, a fresh perspective on this, where this as pollution would be a serious topic in hand. But that again raises the question, how do citizens get to that step? I mean, is there, do you see there being mass protests or some kind of social movements or ways in which this yes. issue gets on the agenda so that new political actors emerge who could tackle this issue? They do. They do. And I'm one of them. What happened was uh, in the last na uh, local elections that we had in, uh, in 2021, a lot of us were fed up from this problem. So a lot of us were fed up. Um, many of us activists banded together and we said, hey, you know what? Let's just run for local elections. And that's exactly what we did. We formed a bunch of these independent uh, activist organizations that we had to jump through a bunch of hoops uh, in the electoral law, uh, trying to avoid being, being stopped by these bigger parties, uh, collect signatures, whatever, go to these local elections. And actually, this was the first time in Macedonian electric, uh, electoral history where so many independent groups managed to get into city and municipal councils, including us. I managed together with my colleague to become a independent Skopje city council member. And what we're doing now is we're showing that normal citizens like us who are not polit politicians by career can be part of the system, can influence what is happening inside and can push these important agendas, including pollution, which we have been doing for the past two years. People are waking up. People are realizing that there's only a certain extent that you can change with protests. There's only a certain uh, extent that you can change it with, with activism from the outside. And you need a collaboration of activism from outside the system and inside the system if you're willing to see serious changes. Otherwise, we're going to be stuck in the protest loop, which we have been doing since 2015. But has, has it gotten better? Unfortunately not. Seriously Balkans. The Be Apart Talks. Thanks for joining us, Dennis. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. So how's the air at the moment in Bosnia, across Bosnia? Well, uh, unfortunately, it's getting bad. We were lucky this autumn because it was fairly uh, warm. So, and we didn't have temperature inversions. But in last week, the weather has changed and finally we have winter coming which means that we have this huge pollution we are dealing with for last decades uh, coming also. So it's bad. Indeed, and this, this is the time of year when everybody is taking out their phone apps to uh, measure the, the quality of the year, right? So what is the main challenge why every year it's the same scenario? The winter is beginning, the pollution is getting unbearable, and is there no change in sight, or, or how do you see the dynamics in Bosnia? Yeah, well, first of all, for us in Tuzla or in Boston in general, or the Western Balkans, we don't need the app. We just open the window and smell the pollution. So we don't need the app to know that the air is polluted. So it's really seriously bad. Uh, I sometimes when I travel, when I come back home, I know exactly the points on the road when I can smell that I'm actually back home, unfortunately. And it's like that for decades, as I said. The problem is basically that the authorities are still just talking about the issue of air pollution. Uh, even that is an improvement because, let's say, 10 years ago, they were not even mentioning air pollution. But now at least the political parties and the authorities are talking about that. But unfortunately, still not working on concrete uh, long-term solutions uh, because... The only long-term solution is phasing out of uh, use of fossil fuel. And that is something that the authorities are not willing to, to, to sort of publicly admit and accept and explain to the population, which, because that means less votes for them in the next elections. And we have elections, unfortunately, every, every two years. Specifically in Tuzla, where you're working, I mean, which part of the, the kind of coal and carbon energy is the main challenge? And, and what would it take to really make a significant difference there? For Tuzla specifically, we have, let's say, three sources of very, very intense uh, uh, air pollution. 
first one is the coal power plant. So we have a very old coal power plant, uh, uh, sort of blocking the exit from the valley where Tuzla is, is located. And further down the valley, we have some other industrial capacities, which are also very polluting and very old. And there we have a problem that the authorities did not implement any of the measures, pollution prevention measures that they were supposed to do in the last 10 years. Uh, when I say any, well, basically there is no desulfurization. So, uh, Tuzla coal power plant is one of the, one of the 18th, I think, 18th coal power plants in the Western Balkans, which do not have, uh, desulfurization equipment. So compared to the European coal power plants, I mean, they're just emitting whatever they burn. I'm talking about sulfur dioxide. And then, of course, the, the, the PM particles and, and the filters for PM particles and, and for NOx are also not in place. So we have all the limit values of all these pollutants are, are constantly, basically, uh, much, much higher than, than it's prescribed in the EU directives. Uh, so basically, that's one problem. Second problem is, is we have problem with household eating, where people are burning coal and... Uh, Quite recently, it's becoming also a problem of, of burning wood or biomass, because as much as uh, they like to talk about uh, wood or biomass as a renewable source, it is also an extremely polluting source of energy. The problem is uh, burning of stuff. I mean, both coal, wood, and whatever people, especially uh, social, socially, uh, uh, social cases, uh, get their hands on. And then you have the transport. So when you combine all these three sources with the temperatures, temperature inversions we have in this part of the year, I mean, it starts usually, well, actually in October, but as I said, we were lucky this year. Uh, then all the pollution that's emitted from all these sources is blocked, basically stuck in the valley of Tuzla. So Tuzla is surrounded uh, from three sides with hills. And then the fourth side, which should be open, is actually blocked by the coal power plant and the other under industry. So everything is stuck there until the weather changes. What you describe in Pertuzla is, of course, we see this in Skopje, we see this in Sarajevo, we see this in Pristina, we see this really quite widely. But I mean, the challenge is really what could be the one, you know, first domino to bring about change in this dynamic. And the thing is that all these pollutants or, or pollution emitters are uh, sort of dealt with by different levels of authority. So, for example, the coal power plants and the industry that is supposed to be controlled and, and in a way, uh, 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 yeah, changes should be pushed by the federal level, so the entity level of authority. When we come to the household heating, it's sort of at the municipal and cantonal level. So. And there are ways to do it. If we are talking about uh, the coal power plants, it's very simple. I mean, even though it's, it's not a popular thing to say because that's why they're not doing it. We have to finally start closing down the old blocks in which uh, they're not planning to install any pollution prevention measures. Then for the remaining blocks, uh, they have the obligation to install the pollution prevention measures by 27. And they should have done it already in 2018, which they did not do. But at the end of the day, the whole energy system based on coal is thanks to the CBAM, which is uh, finally going to be introduced or implemented by 2026 or by 2030. These coal power plants are just going to go bankrupt. And <laughs> the question is, is it actually economically justifiable to invest huge money, something which will be closed in 10 years? I say definitely yes, but uh, keeping just the the necessary parts of the, the, these uh, coal power plants working and stop thinking that they're going to continue to export electricity to EU because of the CBAN. Because the, the specificity of, of Bosnia is basically that we are the only net exporter of, of electricity uh, in the Western Balkan. So that's why I mentioned we didn't have any big crisis. Basically, we were we were exporting some 30% of the produced energy to EU and, 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 and neighboring countries. So we don't have a problem with energy. We have more than enough energy, which is heavily subsidized through the budget, basically with our money. So in a way, taxpayers of Bosnia and Herzegovina were subsidizing cheap electricity, which was exported to the EU during the energy crisis. 
I mean, believe it or not, but it's like that. On top of that, we were sort of subsidizing the same electricity with our health. So that has to stop. But to come back to the solution. So yes, they have to install immediately the pollution prevention measures, this authorization equipment to reduce the PM particles and everything else with the filters as soon as possible. Yes. If I could just jump in here, Dennis, I mean, th- that seems clear priority, but then is then money the main problem? I mean, if, is it about the cost to install these? It's not the money because they, they were thinking to take a loan of 600 and something million euros from the Chinese to build a new block. So if they could afford to build a new block, I'm sure that they could afford to install the disopposition equipment. The problem is that uh, with each, dish, uh, each of these measures, the actual production price of electricity uh, is rising because you have some operation costs, you have to return the loan and everything, which increases the actual cost of electricity. So at the end of the day, it decreases the, the, the actual earnings of the company. And on, on the other hand, it would eventually uh, force them to increase the price of electricity which is, in our case, used as a populist measure. Some people call it a, 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 a social measure, but it's not a social measure. It is a populism measure because they're keeping artificially low uh, prices of electricity, which we are subsidizing, you mentioned, as I said, through, through the budget and with our help. We've had, uh, nearly 10 years ago, massive uh, protests in Tuzla, yes. uh, starting in Tuzla. So the question is, is there some kind of popular this is this affection with this, which could lead to a renewed protest about this issue? Yeah, unfortunately not. The result of, of these uh, we said demonstrations some 10 years ago was that the political parties started talking about the pollution. And uh, they usually start talking uh, at the, well, in, in autumn, as I said, October, November. They usually uh, adopt some conclusions and, 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 and plan somewhere in, in end of January, February. And then when the spring comes, everybody forgets about uh, uh, air pollution. And I come back to the point that basically the, the, the solution for air pollution is simple. Stop burning fossil fuels. Seriously, Balkans. The Beapod Talks. In the second segment of today's podcast, we will present the findings of a year-long project we worked on at BIEPAC. External influences in the Western Balkan region are obviously a hotly debated topic. On the other hand, the green energy transition is not only important and topical, but as we've heard in the first segment, it's also vital for the region, affecting thousands and thousands of lives every year. So how do these two topics interact with each other? Are external actors influencing the green transition in the region? And in what way? Let's find out more about the geopolitics of the green energy transition in the Western Balkans with the BIEPAC members who worked with me on this project. Seriously Balkans, the BIEPAC talks. So the first guest with us here to discuss this topic is uh, Dr. Dimitar Bechev, who's a lecturer at the Oxford School of Global and Area Studies and also a BIEPAC member. Welcome, Dimo. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So Dimitar worked on a background study that really gave us the landscape of the political economy of the energy transition in the Western Balkans. So Dimo, could you take us through this landscape? Could you tell us what were your most important takeaways from this analysis? Well, there's a lot of material that we went through and a lot of points to be made. But suffice to say that the Western Balkans are in dire need to modernize their energy systems because they reliant on uh, legacy assets. And as a result, uh, there is very little political will to change the status quo because political elites benefit from the sort of relationship they have with the energy business, which largely is in state hands. But also consumers are tied to the existing uh, networks, and there is not much pressure to change the status quo. And there is a result on any metric, like uh, pollution, but also emissions uh, more uh, broadly. The Western Balkans is a laggard uh, in the European context. So the big picture that emerges is very much consistent with what we know politically about the region, that it's stuck uh, and nothing is moving forward, or if there's progress, it's very minimal. Right. But what you mentioned about 
reinforcing the status quo, I think it's very interesting because in all these discussions on uh, the external influence uh, um, in the Balkans, we see them usually as a force of disruption, especially those non-Western actors are seen as a force of malign disruption. But what you're saying here is basically that um, local elites, local gatekeepers have an interest in continuing with the same pattern. So I mean, when you say that really that the role of external actors tends to rather than disrupt to reinforce the status quo, and uh, what consequences does that have in your view? That's a fair assessment, I think, because the, what is the status quo about? It's about the rent seeking structure of the economy, mm. uh, where energy, the energy sector, which is critical to any economy, but also the way society functions, and I'd say also politics, uh, is captured by vested interests. Be politicians or businesses close to the political elites. And then, of course, there's an international dimension because foreign companies, no matter uh, what uh, their origin, and also foreign governments might become enmeshed in this relationship. I mean, for instance, you can have investment in coal or also flown uh, investment in coal, which is the case with China. Uh, you can have the Russians through Gazprom claiming parts of the gas business in Serbia and therefore getting some of the rents uh, flowing into their direction. And this also is embedded in a political um, relationship. It's not only about the economy, but also the way elites and states more generally structure their relationships over the long term. So that's the the role of the external uh, influence, trying to fill in the gaps and be present in the region, but it's not necessarily to undermine the status quo. The problem is that the EU, the EU is the transformative factor. It wants things to move forward and to change. And there's a lot of resistance from within the region, but also resistance from the outside by default, because it's much easier to generate geopolitical, but also economic profit from the way things are right now. Great. I think this gives us a very, you know, interesting uh, overview of the political economy of the energy sector and of external influences. Let's get a bit more into the nuances. Dimo, you worked a lot on Russia in the Balkans with a seminal book on this topic, but also on other actors. And recently you even published a book on Turkey. Could you tell us in which way do the strategies of these countries in the Balkans differ? Well, Russia sees the Balkans as a transit region, and it's always been the case. And transit, by I mean, not just energy in, in broad brush terms, but uh, gas in particular. And the natural gas trade differs from other forms of energy business because it's so state-centric. I mean, you're looking at long-term relationships, you're looking at investment into cross-border infrastructure that has to be underwritten by governments. Typically, the companies involved are state-owned as well. And Russia, from, say, the mid-2000s, uh, started looking at Southeast Europe, and this is also uh, written down in strategic documents as a bypass of Ukraine. So there's the connection. So Ukraine has historically been the main conduit for Russian gas exports. But because of the political tensions between Russia and Ukraine, uh, has many dimensions even before the war, before the 2010s, uh, the Russians started exploring um, alternatives. The northern uh, route was one uh, through the Baltic Sea, the Nord Stream, but eventually also the Balkans. The way to realize that was also to invest and to acquire assets. In 2008, you have the acquisition of um, the Serbian National Oil Company, uh, but also the acquisition of uh, Banatsky Dvor, uh, the uh, storage sites uh, uh, in Serbia. But the big picture that became to come to fruition with the South Stream and then the Turk Stream pipeline was to build this transit capacity and allow Russian exports to reach core markets in Central but also Western Europe through the Balkans. And fast forward to today, we see that happening because Ukraine still ships some volumes of gas, but this is expiring at the end of next year because the contract is running out. Nord Stream is blocked, which used to be the main thoroughfare for Russian gas export. And what is left now for the big customers, including Hungary, is the extreme there for the Balkans from a sideshow or auxiliary uh, transit 
path has become the main conduit. And therefore, yeah, Russia is invested into the energy landscape of the region. And before I get to Turkey, just suffice to say that very often when people who don't deal with energy think about Eastern Europe uh, in general, but also the Balkans in particular, they think about energy dependence, but they don't realize that gas in this part of Europe doesn't play such a extensive role. It's not that local economies are that dependent on those supplies. I mean, some places are because you use it for heating, especially in winter months. But it's not that lights go off in Serbia if Russia doesn't deliver gas or in Bulgaria or, or elsewhere. Having said that, it cannot underestimate this relationship because it, it creates political interest and uh, this overlap of interests at the level of political elites and provides leverage for both parties, really. So that's number one. Um, and since you asked about Turkey, Turkey plays a different role because at the end of the day, Turkey is not an energy producer. It's a consumer country that wants to become an energy transit country, and it's moving in that direction uh, over the past, I'd say, 10 to 15 years now, uh, also becoming a, a, a transit uh, corridor for, for natural gas in, into Southeast Europe. But we've seen Turkish investments um, in other parts of the energy systems. Our case study looks at Kosovo, it looks at electricity, where Turkish business is very present. Some of the ways Turkey is doing economic relations is in tune with standard political practices. And I know you've done research on this. I mean, we have the Turkish state, uh, i.e. Erdogan and other top officials negotiating those deals with power holders in the Balkans, and then business follows. So politics comes first uh, very often. How much political leverage that gives to Turkey, I'm, I'm not sure. It's mostly probably about economic rents and sharing it in, in, in the profits by occupying key parts of uh, the energy business. So it's not as malign, I think, overall. Uh, but still, uh, some of the same distortive effect might be present at the local level because the moment you have those external investors coming in and it's heavily politicized, that might eventually make worse on the political economy side the issue of state capture and policy capture. So that's one thing to bear into uh, into mind. But again, it connects to your question about local dynamics being uh, the main determinant. So what gatekeepers, what vested interests, what uh, conditions on the ground dictate. Great. And before getting to some possible recommendations, I wanted to push you on this other controversial point that you hinted at, meaning whether we can really be so clear about dividing this uh, malign and benign influence on geopolitical lines. That's a very good point, yeah. Um, and very often the boundary is, is very fuzzy. For instance, you might have a Turkish investor and you do have some actually investing into renewables in a given Western Balkan country. So is that malign or benign? I mean, it might be in line with with the EU's agenda. And the same applies to China, which, by the way, provides a lot of the materials you need, like solar panels for big uh, renewables facilities. And conversely, you might have a big Western company uh, when asked to pay kickbacks to uh, the local government, and I'm not naming names, obviously, to uh, get their project expedited or get a license, I might be willing to pay local gatekeepers, thereby making worse the problem of state capture and corruption. So it's not that clear-cut, although I think in Russia's case, um, because what Russia does is so politicized, and this argument it's all about business doesn't hold anymore in the age of post-invasion. I think it's much more clear-cut. In the case of China and Turkey, less so, I think. My expectation is kind of hinted in the report is that going forward, we'll see much more of that uh, green projects that contribute formally to decarbonizing the local economy and probably do a good job for citizens and for environmental standards but might be feeding into the problem of corruption and state capture on another level. 
So getting to the end of our conversation, where do you think that this um, really multifaceted and complex picture leaves the European Union as an actor that uh, wants to spearhead change in the green energy transition in the Western Balkans? What would be your recommendations for policy action going forward? Well, it's manifold. I mean, on the first side, the Western Balkans have declaratively or at the level of statements committed to this green agenda, but I don't see much political will, in, especially in coal heavy countries like Serbia or Bosnia, um, to move forward to start phasing out coal and reject the energy systems. And to do so, actually, you need EU to use the stick, uh, i.e. The, the carbon border um, tax that it will be imposed on carbon heavy products, not least electricity that those countries export to places like Croatia, next door, or Hungary. So that, that's number one. But also the EU has to put forward money incentives to compensate, or first of all, to incentivize businesses to invest into green facilities, green capacity, to incentivize governments to develop the grid because without grid modernization, it's difficult to phase in renewables, but also to do what has to happen or is happening in member states, i.e. compensating those constituencies that stand to lose from the green physician, um, say in coal mining areas uh, in Serbia and Bosnia. So you need this multi-pronged effect, combining sticks and carrots and financial, financial resources. And finally, um, I mean, it might be a cliche, but I think a, a, a special significance in this sector, you have to promote regional cooperation because many of those issues with energy supply, with modernization of the electricity grids or other networks, energy networks can be solved at the regional level to, for example, compensate for shortfalls in peak periods and, and foster cross-border integration. So that has to be paid special attention paid. And it's already happening. I mean, look at Kosovo and Albania integrating the energy systems. It's seen as a politi political move, which probably it is at some level, but also has economic significance. And you have to do it not just at the scale of the Western Balkans, but also Southeast Europe, because this modernization as a functional logic doesn't necessarily follow on only political logic. You're a member state, you're not a member state. So there's a lot to do items on the EU's agenda. But yeah, it's about political focus and also about financing and momentum. Great. So multi-pronged action, combining carrots and sticks, engaging with different constituencies, regional cross-border integration, and in a way disrupting this status quo that is keeping the Balkans in a limbo, even in terms of the green energy transition. Thank you, Dimo. You've given us a lot of food for thought. Uh, thanks a lot for being part of Seriously Balkans. Thank you. Seriously Balkans. The Biepad Talks. I'm now pleased to introduce Nikolaos Stifakis, who is a professor of international relations at the University of the Peloponnese and the BIEPAG member too. Nikos has been leading on the public perception survey, which has been carried out in spring 2023 by Kantar on behalf of BIEPAG. Nikos, I'd like to put to you three key findings from our survey and ask you to comment them. So let's start with the first one. We found that there is an overwhelming support for renewable energy. So about seven out of 10 citizens of the Western Balkans think that their country should derive most energy from renewables by 2050. And they think so even in response to uh, an energy crisis. On the other hand, however, we also find that there is uh, um, the economy, which is represented as the main concern. So six out of 10 people uh, think that the economy should be uh, the most depressing concern for their governments. How do we reconcile these two findings? Yeah, these are very interesting uh, findings. On the one hand, uh, there is a clear uh, acknowledgement in the region that uh, Air pollution is a problem. The transition to or the energy transition has some support. We know it's an established fact that several capitals in the Western Balkans figure high uh, among uh, worldwide in terms of uh, toxic emissions uh, several days during the winter. And there is a, an awareness that the CO2, uh, SO2 uh, emissions are uh, in, at, hard, at hazardous levels. At the same moment, this is a region where there is substantial. Uh, energy poverty, where there's a concern about the impact uh, 
on the on the lives of the people. So they want an energy transition, but there is a feeling, there is a fear that uh, this uh, cannot be financed uh, locally, and there is a need for greater external support in making that transition happen. Thank you, Nikos. So second finding. We found that there is a low appreciation of the EU's contribution to the energy transition in the region. So despite all the funds that the EU is uh, um, is channeling into green transition in the Balkans, um, some countries don't really recognize this contribution. This is especially stark in Serbia, where only three out of 10 uh, people interviewed think that Serbia should rely more on the EU in the energy sphere. Uh, and also, we, we found that many citizens of the Western Balkans think that the EU is being too de demanding towards them and their governance uh, governments in uh, in the energy sector. Where does this leave the European Union? I find that these uh, findings are very concerning. Uh, it clearly demonstrates that uh, the EU policies are not fully understood or supported throughout the region. Uh, or to put it in another way, the EU has not managed to make to do policy in the region in such a way that its prescriptions are widely endorsed. And at some point, the uh, Western Balkan people are feeling that the EU is transposing its own energy policy priorities without uh, addressing their concern, which, as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, they relate to the affordability of energy prices and air pollution. Another question is whether, to some extent, these findings are colored by the frustration of the people with a very slow process in the EU in the region's EU accession. And if that is the case, it, we may presume that the, the public support for EU prescribed energy related reforms may be further uh, affected by the start EU enlargement process towards the Western Balkans. And now on to the third finding that we wanted to highlight. We found that there is a low awareness that energy companies from non-Western countries represent a problem at all in the energy sphere. So three figures. 56% of people in Serbia want greater reliance on Russia in the energy sector. This is despite the recognized uh, monopoly that Russia has in oil and gas uh, in the country. Then in Bosnia and Herzegovina, only 8% of uh, the population cites China as a negative influence in the environment and in energy. Whereas in Kosovo, only 3% see Turkey as a problem in this sector. So we have this sort of paradox in which uh, there is, if you will, a recognized adverse influence in certain areas of the energy sector, but we have low awareness among the population. So Nikos, can you help us understand how come is this so and what should be done about it? It is a very troubling uh, finding, and then um, one explanation that uh, is coming to, to our mind is uh, the role of the local media. And I'm mentioning this because according to the same survey, 7 out of 10 people are citing the television as their main source of information. So we are, we have, there are several studies so far that they have demonstrated that the local media depict in a certain way each of these external actors. So they have played their role by giving a positive image, for instance, of uh, China in uh, Serbia or of uh, Turkey uh, in Kosovo or of China in Bosnia. And this uh, representation by the local media does play a role. I would like to add two more things here. The first thing is that most of these local uh, uh, media are regime friendly. So they are following a line which is uh, endorsed or supported by the local uh, regimes. And the second finding that we have seen in other services, but also in our survey as well, is that the general public is not aware of the details of each of these investments. So may, to some extent, their views of this investment, it is much more a projection, a representation of their views of these countries. I have a positive view of Serbia, so I, presumably I have also a positive view of Serbian investments in my country. Thank you, Nikos, for these insights. And now right. let's dig deeper into these three countries, Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo, with our colleagues who have led the case studies on each of them. Seriously Balkans, the BIEPAD talks. Vujo Ilic, who's a research fellow at the University of Belgrade's Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory, is here with us today and uh, he worked uh, on the Serbia case study. So in other words, you found out that there is a very different effect in the way that oil and gas are impacted by Russian presence in Serbia. Can you tell us what are the differences that you found and what are the reasons behind this discrepancy in your view? 
Let's start from the fact that Serbia is a little bit different from the rest of the Western Balkans countries because the political elites and public opinion is very pro-Russia oriented. But also what makes it similar to the rest of the Western Balkans is a slow energy transition. We focused on NIS, which is the oil company in Russia, due to the direct majority Russian ownership. But we also realized very soon that we have to take a broader perspective and other central actors in energy. We analyzed the, the documents, interviewed the stakeholders, and our main findings is that this uh, oil and gas deal from 2008 had very different trajectories in, when it comes to oil and gas. And our main explanation is that this was due to uh, different levels of energy dependence of Serbia when it comes to oil and gas. NIS has, in the last one and a half decade, practically. Uh, it has modernized production, it expanded the network, it uh, created dominant but not monopolist position in the market, and there are some quite strong competitors when it comes to in a country. And uh, from the perspective of stakeholders that we interviewed, their perspective of NIS, it was a highly corporatized entity that did not operate much differently than what we would expect from other companies of its size and stature. But on the other hand, when we uh, started inquiring more about, so how did it go when it comes to gas? Well, Gas is specific because gas uh, was never under complete control of Russian entities. Instead, it was a public company and it remained a public company. But Serbia was at, was and is completely dependent on Russia as a supplier. And we could follow quite a different trajectory there. A Serbia Gas Company is a closed, very untransparent company that most of our stakeholders and interviewers connected it with, with widespread corruption and which also had a strategic goal of maintaining the gas dependence on Russia. So we realized that this dependence on fossil fuels of different kind really shapes strategic choices of a country much more than direct ownership by a foreign entity. And now let's turn to Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have with us Marika Jolaj, who's a lecturer at the Department of Peace Studies and International Development at the University of Bradford, and she's also a BIPAC member. And uh, Marika, we wanted to ask you, could you tell us uh, some of the methods through which the local enablers or gatekeepers, as you call them in your paper, which is very aptly titled, I have to say, Geopolitics Begins at Home. So what are these methods that they used uh, in working together with external actors to detrimental effects? It has three main energy companies. Each of these companies is shareholder company. Only in Republika Srpska it's a mixed holding, but with, with a similar principle, where the state owns around 90% of shares, which means that basically all three companies are state controlled. Because of the abundant resources, Bosnia and Herzegovina is very interesting to foreign actors. And we have found that China has been involved in the past 15 years in almost all energy projects in the country, primarily coal power, but also more recently uh, hydropower and wind power. Seriously Balkans, the Biepad Talks. And finally, we have here with us Donika Emini, who led on the Kosovo case study. Donika is the executive director of the Civicos Network in Pristina and also BIPAG member. Donika, in your research, you highlighted how the Turkish investors, who the company that privatized Kosovo's electricity distribution services, wasn't all malign in its impact on the ground and had some bright spots too. So we wanted to ask you what were the positive and what were the negative parts of it? And also, has this privatization effectively helped Kosovo on its way to a renewable future in your assessment? Obviously, the distribution, the privatization of distribution and supply of the energy uh, in Kosovo was a bit problematic because of course, first of all, starting with a low price, it was only sold for 23 million and everybody's talked about this uh, privatization process, which has been questioned in Kosovo quite a lot. But then, you know, in the meantime, it actually, but through investments, Kets actually and Kesco managed to at least uh, invest in the network, which was already very outdated, which then 
improved energy supply for the clients. That's why in our study, in the question whether, you know, Limak Chalik has really improved the situation on the ground and energy security, most of the respondents have said yes, because, you know, the energy uh, supply has been improved afterwards. Also, there has been like some more investment in that regard. As far as, you know, the second part of the question, which is related to the energy renewables and, and transition, so far we don't know because the privatization has happened happened, but it didn't liberalize fully the market. It was still the market monopoly in Kosovo. Uh, there was still a lot of issues. We have only one you know, producer of energy, which is Kek, and which uses coal, and then Keds and Kesco uh, distribute and uh, the energy that is produced by Kek. If the uh, Kosovo makes the leap to renewables, then it is very interesting to see how these all these new suppliers, prosumers as well, are going to put all the energy in the network owned by Kesco and Keds, and then how is that going to impact the monopoly that this company has had? Uh, so far. I mean, again, both companies, both supply and distribution are owned by the same company. So this really then will impact how the new players are going to be treated and, you know, how that's going to be playing out in the future. Well, thank you so much, Danica, for your work and your insights. Thank you, Vujo. Thank you, Marika, and all the other people and Biebag who worked behind the scenes on these projects, including also Corina Stratula and Zoran Nechev. This brings us to the end of the second segment. Seriously Balkans, the Biepad Talks. Florian, what are the key takeaways from your discussion with Dennis and Gordian? Yes, thanks, Tina. Um, I think one of the key takeaways is a little bit the frustration, of course, that every winter we're having the same discussion and little seems to be moving. I mean, both point out how in Bosnia and Herzegovina, as well as in North Macedonia, Politicians talk the talk, but they don't really do what it takes to change the context. And in one case in Bosnia, we hear from Dennis how uh, different levels of government throw the responsibility to one another. But this, it's not that different in North Macedonia, where it might be not the shifting of responsibility, but still we don't see this kind of real political commitment. And I think the biggest surprise or maybe the biggest kind of insight I, th- I thought was both of them kind of very clear. It's not about the money. Um, You know, yes, it costs money, but there are resources available and it's just about the lack of will to really uh, confront the issue. So that's Jenna, what did you get from, you know, looking back at the study and the the kind of different aspects you discussed? Yeah, I think the study was very rich and it really provided us with a wealth of information. So on the one hand, we had some of our prior, let's say, assumptions that were confirmed in terms of, uh, for instance, the local actors being key, really, in keeping the gate open or closed to other actors. So this role of the local gatekeepers was really confirmed as as crucial in allowing for any malign or positive activity in regard to energy transition, as well as in, in other respects. What we've seen from this uh, public perception survey is that actually the people on the ground don't really quite grasp that there is a very clear connection between the two. And this is one clear finding from our study, meaning that um, it's very important to actually explain the activity of the external actors in the right way. Because if this narration, if this influence is uh, is mediated by the local actors, which uh, basically obfuscated through narratives in the media and politics, this will not get to the population. And therefore, there will be a much uh, lower call for change. On the other hand, we have also seen some positive surprises, uh, including the great activism on the streets of the cities of the Western Balkans, which was, uh, I think, confirmed by your great uh, interviews with uh, both Dennis and, and Gordian, seeing how really there are some grassroots activities that are people who are standing up to demand uh, for action on, on air pollution and on wider green transition challenges. And uh, furthermore, we knew that the Western Balkan public support for um, the transition towards renewables, but we weren't aware of the extent of it. So we've seen from our study that over two thirds, so over 70% of people in the Western Balkans support this green transition. 
And importantly, even when asked about a trade-off between high energy prices and renewables, they still want investment in renewables. So this is a clear, clear potential to be unlocked in the future. And the EU really needs to give more funds and more resources in order to unlock it properly. Yeah, thanks, Tina. I think this is, you know, the, the door has been open to the debate and there's the activism and even resources and ideas. And I think we're going to have to keep watching this topic and see how uh, the door will be open to really make this step into, well, the, the, the energy transition and also dealing with pollution across the region. So thanks for listening to this latest episode of Seriously Balkans. We will hope that you'll join us soon for our next podcast. Thanks. Thank you and see you next time. You've been listening to Seriously Balkans, the BIPAC Talks. This podcast is produced by the Balkans in Europe Policy Advisory Group, a joint project of the European Fund for the Balkans and the Center for Southeast European Studies of the University of Graz. Find out more about our research, analysis and advocacy at www.biapag.eu.